people who don't want to do well. But we have a tendency, there is a tendency to develop an insular culture and to want to do your job. You know, if you think about it, when are you most kind of, when is life easiest? When somebody gives you a pretty finite task and they kind of give you the resources, they get out of the way and you don't get any phone calls and you don't get any distractions because you can just do what it is you have to do. I mean, I'm that way too. I go to work on Saturday and Sunday because nobody's messing with me and I can kind of do stuff. It doesn't mean I'm my most productive. I may think I am because I'm sending out emails or doing something like that, but I'm not really connected with people. They come in Monday morning and they go, oh shit, he worked again this weekend. <laughs> uh, but the reality is I'm thinking I'm doing my thing and I'm doing it with good intentions and as much skill as I have and I'm defining success a certain way. Now what happened in JSOC is in our organizations they all define success differently. Now if you'd said what's success, they'd go, oh you know we gotta win the war. But you went to Delta Force, they'd say we gotta we gotta capture or kill X number of bad guys. If you go to the communicators, well we gotta connect to here, here, here. Those are all tasks they have to do. But it's like baseball players. You can have a high batting average, but if the team doesn't win, it doesn't matter. And so what we found was our failures routinely didn't occur because someone couldn't shoot, couldn't communicate, wasn't strong enough, wasn't brave enough. Our failures all happened at the friction points. We had this process called find, fix, finish, exploit, and analyze. And it's a targeting cycle. Everybody's got a cycle. You've probably got one that you look to acquire land, you, you get investors, you build something, you sell it or rent it. You know, there's a cycle that goes. And ours usually involve finding an enemy target, fixing it into a location, putting a predator, make sure they didn't leave, finishing, going, capturing and, and or killing, exploiting the information we got from the computers, the documents, etc., and then analyzing it, learning from it, and do it again because you get quicker and quicker. Our problems were all at the, we called it the blinks between the points. But everybody in their, their functional part or silo thinks they're doing great work and they, they are. But it doesn't equal great work. So the first thing we had to do with our organization was reach back and make sure everybody understood what winning was. And winning, we defined it as destroying Al Qaeda's network and everything else was subordinate and contributory to that and we didn't care much about your statistics we didn't want to know your batting average or anything like that we only cared whether we got that and we figured we learned first that most people didn't even have a vision of it they had been given tasks do this they do that but they'd never been invited into the senior leader meetings where all the pieces of the puzzle are put together so we hadn't trusted them with contextual understanding and plus we sort of rationalized, well, you know, they're too busy. Why should we bother them with the big picture? Just get down there and work. In reality, the big picture is, became for us the holy grail. And we called it shared consciousness. So what we did was, we started with a philosophy. We're going to push information across the command, in, out, up, down, every which way, with a level of aggressive behavior that we never had before. And suddenly we're going to pass information to people that were either too junior or too this or that or went in their silo. And even if it didn't feel relevant to them, we're going to pass it. And so we started with this daily video teleconference that existed when I took command. It was between the rear headquarters at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and the four headquarters at Baghdad, where I was. We had about 25 people at each end, and every day we'd get together and we'd talk about what the headquarters talk about. And then the theory was that information would trickle out of that meeting and then new information would come up and it would inform that and 24 hours later we'd do it again. But the reality is both of those entities weren't hermetically sealed but they weren't as well connected through and they couldn't do it fast enough and so as a consequence it's kind of a conversation between two entities or self-licking ice cream cones as we call them. And we said well that's just not practical. There's no way we can get information out fast so we opened it up in bits and pieces, essentially we opened it eventually to everybody. And so we went to about 7,500 to 9,000 people a day for 90 minutes. Whole command, plus all our partners, CIA, Department of State, FBI. And you go, oh my God, you're gonna take an hour and a half of every work day and you're gonna open it up to everybody. Not everybody's on because some people are out flying and doing what they do, but everybody, and we record it and put it on our website so anybody who's not on can see it. 
And you say, well, that seems like a colossal waste of time. Somebody goes, another meeting. It was the most efficient thing we did. It pre prevented a million meetings because at one point every day, everybody hears what's going on in Afghanistan, Horn of Africa, Iraq. What happened the night before? What do we plan tonight? What's doing? There's a conversation. It's not a, a sterile briefing to the leader. So it's this conversation. So it's like everybody gets into the C-suite for 90 minutes every day. When they walk out, several things have happened. The first is they understand what's going on. The implication of that, however, was we could empower execution down to lower levels because they didn't have to come up the chain of command for approval because they had the contextual understanding. They're close to the problem. Just decide. And that's what we did. I, I, I approved every operation when I first took over. Two years later, I approved none. We were doing four a month when I took over. By the summer of 2006, we were doing 300 a month, 10 a night and I approved none of them. Now, I was aware of all of them, but I, it would slow it down too much if I was in, approving it. So this consciousness empowered execution, but it did a couple other things. It gave people a sense of ownership. Suddenly, everybody's trying to win the pennant, not work on their batting average. Everybody sees every day, this is the picture we're dealing with, this is what we got to do, and they have the ability to connect dots that a single individual never can, and the whole organization starts connecting dots laterally across those silos that they didn't do before because they didn't know each other. So we had this daily video teleconference with 7,500 to 9,000 people, and we have 15 chat rooms operating simultaneously across the command. So as we're doing this, people are chatting to each other. I got to talk to you later about this. Tell me more about that. If I would get frustrated, I'd take my glasses off and wipe my forehead. There'd be people chatting. What's wrong with him, you know? Um, and it changed the mindset. And people started to take a different level of ownership of what we were trying to do. It was, the, it was probably the single biggest exemplar of driving the change in our culture. But that change was represented in a completely different level of speed, different level at which we made decisions, different level of ownership, and then no longer a respect for those silos. People just started to understand that you didn't have to go this way to communicate. You were not only encouraged, but you were expected to go across the, the silo lines. So the way of getting that is, you know, sort of an analogy to, to your four, uh, sectors. You can be really good in construction. You can be really good at any other parts of it. But the reality is no part of it can really be a profitable entity by itself. I mean, if you go at the end of the day, you can do your part, but they are all parts of a whole. They, they have to be parts of a whole. And there's a concept called MISI, mutually uh, exclusive, collectively exhaustive. And what that means is if you have a square and you divide it into four parts, but they don't overlap. Each buddy's got, everybody's got their little part of it. It's mutually exclusive. Nobody's stepping on anybody else's turf, collectively exhaustive. And that looks good and it briefs well because it looks very efficient, but the reality is things we do cross those lines every day and they blur. And so when you create those bright red lines, what you've really done is created gaps potential gaps and potential friction points. So I'm a great believer you've got to have a lot of overlap. And we did that essentially through shared consciousness. Yeah, I remember in your book there was, there was a side-by-side -side diagram. And one looks like a quilt with boxes exactly where they should be, which represented each person's role uh, in a scientific management style. Exactly. And then there was this sort of reality of life, which is, or maybe a, a more perfect organization where everything was crossing and all messed yeah. up looking. So to your point, it wasn't, didn't present as well, but in reality, that's how the business ran. That's right. I, I think when you all read the book, and some of you probably have, you, you'll be, it really strike, strike me that the paradoxical nature of a four-star general writing a book that basically preaches hands-off management. So here you are at the zenith of your power in control of this massive operation. And your biggest takeaway, what you're imploring us all to do, is to push decisions down. Yeah. And how were you able to accomplish this in a military that had been steeped in yeah. hundreds and hundreds of years of history, completely opposite that these? Yeah, there, there are two parts to that. First is, you don't go there willingly. I didn't come up with the idea, I'm going to 
work my life to be a general and then give all my power away. Um, and you grow up in this heroic model of leadership where you think about it, a leader has an expectation that they're going to have the answers and they're, when somebody comes to them for an answer you're expected to know and you're expected to be decisive and you're, you're never expected to say, well I have no idea how we're going to do that because then people might question you as a leader. But the reality had changed. My grandfather had been a military officer yes. than my father. When my grandfather joined during the First World War, and then when he left the service at the, after World War II, things had changed, but in reality, that the basic weapons and whatnot had not evolved much. So my grandfather was an infantryman. Through the course of his career, he could expect it to be the most expert guy in his organization because the change had been small enough where it was okay. The things we did from the time I was a young officer till I was general changed completely. So for me to look at young you know, teams in combat and say, this is how it has to work, and they'd go, well, your wars were completely different from mine, so you don't even know. How could you? So you have to first get over the hump of that, admit that you have contribution to make, but it's not particularly what you thought it was. The second is, you want to be a heroic leader, and you want to micromanage things because we think of ourselves as, particularly in the information age, I could sit in my command center, we had 12 screens, I could watch every operation ongoing from a predator, and it's just like watching on TV from above. It's very clear, you can see individuals moving around, and they pumped it through our computer system, so I actually could listen to every radio call from every operation, and if I wanted to, I could reach in and talk to them. And you say, well, wow, that's a micromanager's dream. <laughs> but I never did it. I never I didn't even listen to them. I just watched it for background. I sort of marinated in the information, but I knew I didn't know what was going on on the ground. A two-dimensional picture doesn't give you how cold it is, how tired people are, how scared people are, don't hear the noise, you don't know any of that. So don't pretend you do and try to manage it, but appreciate it so that you can support the individuals who are down there doing it. So um, as a leader, that's the first part. I had to change my expectation of myself, and which has a, it's a shift in your ego. Um, you have to back away, but, and I want to be a heroic leader. I want to be the guy with all the answers. I really do. But I really hate to lose. And we were losing this war. And that's the one thing I just can't live with. I will do anything to avoid losing. And so, and I work with a lot of people who have that same gene, and so, if changing is what we had to do, okay, that's what we're going to do. Now, the organization's different. Even if you get one person to change or one person at a time, organizations have muscle memory and they have cultures. And cultures come for a reason. Cultures aren't this weird thing that just grows up that's strange. Even we look at foreign cultures and we go, boy, that's very different. Why would they do that? That's illogical. Most people are rational. If you go tear apart a culture, you'll find there's a rational underpinning to everything. The Afghan culture was so different to us, but when you're down in villages, when you really get into it, it's pretty logical. And so, military is the same way, and hierarchical culture is the same way. Not always the right culture. I mean, they, it, sometimes they're either outdated or they might have gotten skewed, but the point is there's a strong culture that's been reinforced over time. If people act a certain way, they are reinforced either through re reward or absence of accepting risk. In the Pentagon, people won't make decisions. And they've been taught not to make decisions. They don't think they have, but they have. And they've got this system where everything is, you get everything uh, staffed to the point where everything risk is mitigation. And if you come to somebody from a tough decision, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of people will go, and you're asking to do a difficult operation and it's time sensitive and they'll go, they'll ask some questions and they'll go, how much wood can a woodchuck chuck? I go, what are you talking about? There are no woodchucks in this operation. And what they're doing is they're saying, well, come get me the information. And they've, they've kicked the can. You come back. By now, you, you know the woodchuck answer, but you don't, that opportunity's come or gone. And they, they go, damn it, I really want to do that operation. They didn't make a decision. They didn't disapprove it, their hands are clean, and they accepted no personal risk. And so as a consequence, what happened is we ran into that constantly. Not always that overt, but, but in many cases that way. So 
you're trying to get an organization to change from the way it is and you've got to convince people first that winning is the most important thing and you have to define it for them and you have to keep doing that constantly. This is winning for Brazudo. This is winning for JSOC. This is how everybody connects. You've got to align people on what that is, what their part does to that. Make sure that, in, and quite often in Oregon, ours it wasn't, it wasn't aligned at all. We had to align that and keep, keep beating on it. And then you have to celebrate very openly in our, our operations intelligence video teleconference gave the opportunity to celebrate and reward just verbally. We couldn't give bonuses or anything, but celebrate those people who were doing that kind of stuff that contributed and then sort of quietly shape against those places that weren't. Um, again, you often don't have to take dramatic action, but even small things will, will shape people in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, one of the things my father taught me is when you go into a meeting, you always ask yourself, what does victory look like? It's may, maybe an appropriate military metaphor. But I think when you have your eye on, on the prize, and it's funny, those meetings where I don't think of that, they're sort of amorphous and they don't, you may or may not have won. What did you do? And the other thing, when, when we had dinner, we were talking about this, what was a 90 minute teleconference every day? And I was thinking to myself, how do you get people interested in 90 minutes of, of any meeting? Yeah. And we, we talked about the work that your team did with our construction company. And uh, um, we said, well, we provide beer <laughs> at, the, uh, at the meeting. And Allie, your associate, said to me, I want you to get to a place where the meeting itself is what draws people to the meeting. And the beer can be there for fun. Uh, so we, we are working very hard on creating me meetings only when they are meaningful and yeah. we can all focus on this victory. If I can shift gears a little bit, um, I think we have time for maybe one or two yeah. more questions and then we're going to open it up to your all's questions if you would like. My, my personal favorite chapter in your book was what you called leading like a gardener. And in that chapter my favorite quote was the role of the senior leader was no longer that of a controlling puppet master but rather that of an empathetic crafter of culture. I really love that crafter of culture, empathetic crafter of culture. I like that word in particular. I especially appreciated the amazing mental leap it, it must have taken you to describe yourself in a published book as a gardener, which candidly remind me of, reminded me of my relatives, you know, where I came from, versus the four-star general that you are. So tell us what you meant by leading like a gardener, and what does it mean to be an empathetic crafter of culture? Yeah, um, and I, nobody's ever accused me of a mental leap before, so that's good. Um, it's been as a compliment. I'm fooling somebody, <laughs> you know. Uh, if you think about what a leader does, and a, a general's an uber example of this, but it's true in most organizations, this desire to control things is not just because you're power mad, it's because you feel responsible. I feel responsible for getting the best outcome I can, so therefore I'm trying to do everything that I possibly can, and I may be the most experienced or, or whatever, the best informed. And so the, the first thing we try to do is make it so that the senior leader is not the best informed anymore, so that everybody has got much, much more information. But you, if you draw the analogy to a chess master, because chess is an interesting strategy game. It's, it's played one-on-one. -on -one. You're across a 64 square board and you're looking at somebody. You have 16 pieces, they have 16 pieces. Each side, 16 pieces, move according to the same very set rules. And the, there are different kinds of games of chess based upon how long, how fast you want to play, limits on movement. But in reality, it's two strategists, and that's where the game came out of 6th century uh, India, as a way to train strategy. And so the theory is if you're really good at this, your strategy of moving your 16 pieces will beat your enemies. And that's the way I kind of thought of myself as this leader. Okay, I'm going to maneuver my people better than my opponent does. The problem is when we started the fight, you know, I moved my piece. Zarqawi moves his piece. I move another piece. He moves a piece. And then maybe I go to the restroom and go get a sandwich and he moves again. And then I sit there and he moves again. And I'm still thinking, then he moves again. And you go, wait a minute, that's against the rules. And then I'm reminded there are no rules. And then suddenly I look across and you're really not playing against Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, you're playing against 16 opposing chess pieces, all of which communicate with each other all the time, all of which have authority to execute on their own. 
and all of us all of which are essentially autonomous but connected by intent and you say wait a minute I'm playing against 16 people who recognize no rules and I'm trying to micromanage 16 dumb pieces and you know I can't do it well what if it's 16,000 across the table from your 16 million suddenly you're trying to deal with something that isn't a single node limited by the cognition of one brain or one small staff or something like that suddenly the collective intelligence of all these pieces constantly informing each, each other just destroys you so as a consequence what I learned is I didn't stop acting like a chess master because I wanted to I stopped because I wanted to win I had to change now once I changed the analogy came out to me because my mother was a huge gardener I mean she was a vegetable gardener you know she's not interested in flowers and you know I tended to manure piles so you know my job but it struck me you know the gardener doesn't grow anything plants grow things and so what the gardener does however is not irrelevant the gardener doesn't throw seeds out in the spring and come back in summer or fall and collect this big harvest. The gardener creates an environment, an ecosystem, prepares the soil. The gardener waters, the gardener weeds, the gardener tends, the gardener harvests, the gardener does all of these things, but the plants are doing the essential and unique work and they're doing it simultaneously. So if you do it right, suddenly a leader as a gardener is creating this environment and leveraging the capacity of every part of the organization and doing what it does very well and if you can make them as informed as possible it'll be, they'll be important and you know we had this command and control period in management that really started in the second half of the 19th century with the industrial age and it, it sort of went to its uber apogee as we got really good assembly lines and all this sort of stuff but it started to crumble once information technology moved so fast that now we competition is no longer a big organization against you it's all of these different entities your your competitors now are your clients your customers smaller startups it's all these things that are non-traditional in nature and that's the way it is in warfare now too you're you are not fighting a single general with this army that they're maneuvering you're fighting this army of differing competitors that all are have a have a shared cause or at least overlapping cause so to me going to the gardener style of leadership uh, was essential but it was also very rewarding because when you start to see the organization hum like that it's one thing to be in the room and they come and they say oh great one make the decision you make the decision and then everybody bows and, and walks out um, but it's even more fun to sit in an organization and just watch it humming I was in my crystal group today and uh, you know I'm the co-founder and I'm sitting on the third row back on the side and we're doing one of our daily business development meetings we're going through it and and I'm just occasionally contributing there wasn't any moment where, where they stop and look at me and they go what do we do next they just do it and to me that's a great level of comfort because if I'm off doing this this afternoon that's okay that thing's gonna roll on and they're not just gonna do they're not going to execute last orders what we say and we, we used to say in Afghanistan to people he says if the order we give you isn't right execute the order we should have given you and it, it just makes it I, I find that fun to watch and fulfilling and not so hard well I love your idea of, of the gardener cr uh, cultivating right and creating exactly. sort of the soil and overseeing it you know, we, we see in many ways our core mission as a company, uh, we call it the creation of extraordinary experiences for our customer. So the things that we're doing either by the buildings we're building or the service we provide creates a vessel by which we're asking our customer to live this experience. Your point is ask the employees to live the experience, right? You and I talked about this a couple of examples. You know, Rich Carlton has empowered yes. their employees to fix the problem. And if you think about it, what's your greatest frustration? You go somewhere, you know, I'm on the board of an airline. We don't do this, but others do. You know, something will be wrong, and you'll go to a person, and you'll go, I have this problem, and they go, I don't have any information about your problem, and I have no authority to do anything about your problem, but thank you for flying X airlines. 
or you go to a, a <laughs> store. And, and the same thing, and what they've done is they've compartmented functions so you never really meet the person who's responsible for your problem. And they've done it on purpose because it's very easy for someone to say, boy, I, I empathize with your problem, I sympathize with your situation, I can't help you. And Ritz-Carlton said, fix the problem. If a, if a customer has a problem, fix it. If it costs Ritz-Carlton money, fix it. And we'll worry about that later. JetBlue's, uh, I'm on the board there, their uh, mantra is be America's favorite airline. Do what it takes to do that. If you think about it, it's pretty powerful. Favorite airlines are safe, they're on time, they're courteous, they're user friendly. And if everybody makes every decision through a lens like that, as you say, make the customer's experience amazing. If you stop back and say, what should I do to make the customer's experience great? I think you produce profitable organizations. And make extraordinary things. It's so that, that's, that's the beauty of that. Yeah, the Ritz Carlton model, as you described in your book, even has a $2,000 per employee stipend that they use for instant guest pacification. Right. I've tried that with my kids. <laughs> with it's candy. higher than 2000 it's, Yeah, yeah, it's, it's edible. Um, it, but it's this, it's, it's a really amazing shift. And as you read Team of Teams, you, you'll notice this, that the, the history of business has been predicated on, on this scientific management model, which to your point, peaked at the, at the sort of Ford Motor Cars assembly line. But what you're speaking to is a pure empowerment of employees, right. which makes that whole other model go completely berserk. That's right. Because the supposition is that uh, your individual employees are not capable of just one thing, but of very many things. And right. they can think for themselves, which of course we believe very strongly in this organization. We've also found because of our silos, which we I hate to refer to as silos, We've broken down some of those walls by allowing and, and watching employees move from one silo to another. Yeah. So a management person could become a development person, a construction person, a, a development person, etc. Um, we, you described in your book how you would have each group know someone in another group. So it really seems that you're speaking to this, again, to the shared consciousness of an organization. Yeah, when, when you're a small organization, you know, any small team, you know everybody. Finish each other's sentences, you know, that, that sort of thing. Once you get bigger than that, you can't be one team. You can't be a team of a thousand people. You can't know them all. What you can, however, and I argue, need to be a team of teams. You're necessarily going to have small teams that do tasks, and they may shift around, but you're going to have that. But what you can do is try to create the same connection between those small teams that you do between individuals and a small team, which doesn't always happen, but the good ones do. What we did was we tried to make sure everybody knew somebody in other teams. So for example, you wouldn't know, if you're in Delta, you wouldn't know all the SEALs, but you'd know some, a few. And what that did was you go, wow, you know, I didn't know any SEALs, but you seem like a pretty good guy. Are your compartment, you know, compadres like you? And you go, yeah. You transfer a level of trust and common purpose greater than you'd ever had before. Who do we hate? We hate everybody we don't know. We have a point in the book where we go, there's a, and it's a great seal quote, it says, the point after which everyone else sucks. <laughs> and it starts with, in my small group, I know people, I tolerate the people in the next ring, and all those people over yonder who I don't deal with, they just by definition aren't good people. Well, think about the world that way. Differences in language, cultures, religions. We don't know them. We may not hate them, but we don't trust them for sure. And so, but once you know one person, you go, wow, that's different. And so I think it's really important to build those bridges and, and that takes leadership to consciously do. It doesn't automatically happen. Absolutely. Uh, I would like to take some questions yes, from the audience, if that's okay with you. The honor. Would anyone like to take the first shot? Yes, ma'am. Hi, General. My name is Allison Studer. I'm a captain retired from the Air Force, and I was pulling with our logistics rating officer uh, with command designation, and I incidentally was in Baghdad uh, from 2007 to 2008. I was the aide de camp for uh, Admiral Ed Winters. I worked with JSOC. So Are you still scarred by the experience? Absolutely. <laughs> we used to call Admiral. Ed, he was the commander of SEAL Team 6 before that. We always called him Special Ed. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. <laughs> Yeah, that's great, Allison. Thanks, and thanks for what you've done. Um, I'm going to start by not listing the things that are obvious, integrity and, and you have to care. I mean, those are just prerequisites to even be, in my mind, and considered a leader. I think the qualities that, that are less common, but, but I think the good leaders I see, and I'd say the first one is empathy. And when I talk about empathy, make sure you don't think I mean sympathy. I'm not talking about rubbing people's backs when they're tired. I'm talking about the ability. Yeah. I'm talking about the ability to turn around and see the problem from their standpoint. Have you ever been across a business negotiation table or a diplomatic one or military one, and you just sit there? These guys just don't get it. They are stupid or they're evil or whatever. If you can switch that around and say, wait a minute, let me get their frame of reference. If if you think about our relationship with Iran right now, they have a lot of reasons to mistrust us and they got a lot of reasons to want to have a nuclear weapon. Now, I don't agree with all that they do, so don't, I'm not an apologist, but you switch that around, there's a lot of logic to where they're coming from. And so for us not to be able to empathize and say, okay, I kind of get that, you know, and the same is with the people who work with you and for you and, and whatnot, you got to be able to to at least appreciate that um, as you do it. I'd say the second one is you have to be able to communicate. We aren't all raised with the ability to communicate and none of us um, are as good as we'd like to be, but the effort to communicate what you're thinking, what you're doing and cross the command is something that I don't think we in the military train well enough. Um, in my class at Yale, it's the thesis of the course is two plus two does not equal four. Now you know I'm not a math major. But the point of that is, and particularly in a city like this, in a room, two plus two equals what the people in the room decided equals. And so you can have the right answer. You can come in with the perfect plan, business thing, whatever. You can lay it down. And if other people won't pay attention to it, it's irrelevant. So really, the people who are most effective have to be able to communicate a plan, even an imperfect one. Uh, because at the end of the day, you got to get that done. Um, I guess the last one I'd thrown out is discipline. Um, there are people with extraordinary charisma, extraordinary brains, extraordinary other things, but personal discipline. And what I mean is, most of us know what good leaders should do. The problem is what good leaders should do and what we do on a daily basis is usually not quite the same. And even when I was in jobs that I really wanted to do well in and I, I worked hard, I would have a certain number of times during that day when I wasn't the leader I wanted to be. A young person would come to me and I'd snap at him, or I'd make a uh, sarcastic comment when that was not the appropriate response, or I would do something like that. And that was a lack of discipline. That was me giving in to something I knew I shouldn't have done, and uh, or not doing something I knew I should have done. And so discipline is a personal thing, you, you gotta work on it, but it's good to have supporting people who, close to you, who help you be disciplined. My sergeant major was really good for that, I've got an executive assistant right now, because I sit down with her and I go, here's what I wanna do, boom, 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 and then when I get weak and I start not doing it, she's sitting there going, hey, you said you are gonna do this, is that no longer a good idea? And, all right, you know, I keep thinking I'm gonna fire her, but you know, she may fire me. <laughs> But, but I think those are the three big things. Um, when you talk about what brings uh, leaders down, you know, I think there are lots of things. I mean, there are all the failures we talk about, you know, integrity or something like that, that's or discipline, that's one. But you know, we get very task-oriented sometimes as leaders and we forget what our job is. Um, the job of a senior leader in Bazudo, your dad's job or whatever, is not to build houses or, or buildings or anything like that. It's to lead this organization. Other people are gonna do the building. And yet you can get so focused on pieces, I call it chasing ground balls, 
you know, people will come to you for dinner and do things and you can find yourself and there's a temptation to do it because you think it needs to be done or whatever and yet that takes away all your energy and bandwidth to be able to go lead. And so I see some marvelous people who don't lead very good organizations because they don't take the time to lead. They're, they're just another executor. Thanks again, Allison, for what you've done. Thank you so much. Do we have yeah. Dan, please. General, um, Call me Tom, Stan, please. Uh, Tom Bizzuto. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your service. And thank you for being with us today. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of reading your book, and I look forward to it. But in your discussion here with Toby, uh, you've talked a lot about empowering your, your colleagues to achieve an end. Can you elaborate a little bit about how that end gets achieved? Uh, uh, when I think about the organization you led, you know, that Ivan worked in, there's a quality of excellence that pervades um, of, of real discipline, real extraordinary excellence that pervades it. How do you achieve that at the same time you're empowering everyone? Yeah, that's a great question because now, when I took JSOC, I had an advantage that the small teams that were the, the core of it were already very good. You know, Delta Force SEALs, they technically and tactically competent. And so I didn't have to worry a lot about that. What I had to do was see if we could connect those things together in a way that would produce an excellent outcome. And that was more difficult than I probably appreciated when we started that. So for example, um, we are there in Iraq to produce a safe and stable Iraq. That's the point. We have a mission to destroy Al-Qaeda, my organization in Iraq. Um, my subordinate organization started to look at their mission as I will go after this part of the network and I will get this person, this enemy leader, and I'll take them out of the, the fight. And that all makes sense. And they go, okay, this is my job. I got to get out of my way. Let me do my job. So we would go on raids and we would go into an area and we would do a night raid and we would kill a bad guy and shoot up the neighborhood and we would leave and it would be smoking when we left and we'd be high-fiving and saying, and our, and our superiors were patting us on the back and saying, great job. The conventional US force or allied force that was operating in that area goes, holy smoke. You know, there was a bad guy here, but now we got a smoking neighborhood, may have collateral damage. You got your guy and you left me with this real problem. Now where are you? But we're on to the next great thing. And we were getting constantly reinforced by this. And so my subordinate leaders, as we empowered them to strike, uh, the big problem was if we empowered them negative or narrowly, then they are gonna do exactly what they know how to do in a narrow sense. Um, but in the macro sense, I would argue, for the first two years, we were, we were very important on the battlefield, but for every two steps forward my command took, we were pulling everything back one step because the negative aspects of what we were doing, because we weren't, we didn't understand the bigger picture. I didn't get it to my subordinates so that they understand the real, the end state here is this, you may need to get some of this, but at the end of the day, this is the end state. You've got to understand that I've got to communicate that with you and whatnot. We, we took quite a long time getting to that. And then when you empower, there's also this danger that you're going to have a loss of either maturity in decision making or effectiveness in execution. I didn't find effectiveness in execution a problem. What I did was I pushed it down to people and I said, do what, accept as much risk as you, because you're going to go on the operation. And I would go down and go on them periodically just to make sure they knew I was willing to. Um, but they, that was pretty much, you know, they, they would do that because they're rational people and they don't want to get killed. But there were a couple of other problems with it. One, taking ownership of the big thing, but also, uh, being able to uh, balance this desire to be effective every time and have a high batting average and this desire to produce overall outcome. So a lot of people initially wouldn't go do operations that they weren't really sure would be 100% successful because they didn't want the perception of failure. And so what I had to do is convince them. I said, 
here's what we're looking for. We're looking for this many successes getting the guys off the battlefield. If we got to do 100 raids to get 50 guys, that's better than us doing 51 raids to get 49. And, but that was counter to our culture because nobody wanted to get on that video teleconference and say, sir, we did three raids last night and they were all dry holes, which was our term for a failure. So what I had to do to learn to do was say, hey, I'm not worried about dry holes. As long as you're doing things correctly, what I'm worried about cumulative success. And so it had to change in how I responded on video teleconferences, how I rewarded people, you know, and, and whatnot was, was really key there. And that was a learned thing. I could, I could say it on day one, but nobody's going to believe it until they see you exhibit that behavior over time. And the one great thing about the frequent video teleconference is normally in an organization we're about 15,000 people across 27 countries um, if they only see the leader once a year or something like that you don't get to have that effect but when they see you constantly on a video teleconference they get if you make a mistake on day one you can kind of help fix it on day two um, so it's sort of a, mod a modern version of uh, what you call battlefield circulation right which yes. is the thesis that the general where in this case the CEO or president goes around as many places as possible, sees as many people yeah. as possible. Tom, so, you're famous for this. Yep. You go around looking at stuff, and I'm going to put words in your mouth. Or, or in fact, let me tell you, what do you look at for when you go out there? Um, and the, uh, well, I, I always say there are three reasons I go out. One, one is because. The people out there are the ones who are having contact with and shaping the perspective of the company with our customers. Mm -hmm. And so they're more important than I am. So I'm first going out to pay my respects. Um, I learned that from my father. Secondly, I don't do the hiring of the company. Kristen and her colleagues do. So I'm going to see the people we're hiring are people I'm comfortable having. And then the third reason I go out is because nobody in the office will ever tell me. And who they trying to do? Um, they want to solve the problem themselves. And yeah. so, and, and yet the people in the field uh, are always uncomfortable saying this is screwed up. So that's right. That's the reason. And you just see it and feel it. I imagine you can walk onto a site and just kind of know. I mean, we do all these raids one night, and I'm going with the SEALs, and I, I would go out with people. And we go on this raid, and I said, okay, don't. I, I was trying to get them not to hit, you know, to circle houses, and then call people to come out and surrender, and, you know, less gunfire, and people getting hurt. So we go to this one, and I'm with them, and I'm about 10 feet down from the, the commander of the raid. There are about 20 of us. And uh, we have a dog with a camera hooked on it that can go in and and scout out the house. But they do this call out, we called it, and a, a female came out and they, she comes and they've got an interpreter and the field leader is talking to her and you know. And then I see him pull out, looks like a skateboard helmet. And it's got a camera on the top with these two earphones. Looks almost like the one you see at NASCAR races with two beer cans and the thing, you know. <laughs> and I'm watching this and they pull this thing out of this bag and they hold it in front of this female and then they put it on her head and I'm watching. And I watch a little while, and finally I crawl, we're behind this little wall, I crawl over there and I go, what is happening? And they go, well, we're gonna send this female into that, back into the house she came out of, with this camera on her head, and we're gonna tell her where to go and whatnot. And I said, why are you doing that? They said, well, we're worried about booby traps, and we don't wanna put the dog at risk. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Let's have a philosophical conversation here. And we did, and they go, yeah, that's a good point, sir. All right, good, well, we won't do that. But, you know, it's great people trying hard, trying to do all the right things, but every once in a while getting down there, just let you, I'd have never known that was happening until I get down there and kind of touch it and, and do it, and so. I, I, loved, I loved your story at dinner where you said you would go up to soldiers during the war and you would say, how, you know, how, how's everything? And everybody would say, good, sir. Yeah. That was the first answer. He'd ask again, how are you today? Good, sir. That was the second answer. You'd say, ultimately, you'd pull them aside. You'd ask them maybe a third or a fourth question, and ultimately, they would open up. And my question to you at the time was, 
you know, how, how did they know to do that? And you said, because I was listening. Yeah. Uh, what I did, the technique was, about that third question, you sit down. And when, when a senior person sits down, it means you're not moving. Because if you ever had somebody come ask you, how you doing, at a like, cocktail party, and then they look over your shoulder to see someone more interesting. And I just stop talking. I don't even answer the question. I just stand there, you know. Um, that's the worst case. But if a senior leader comes to you and go, how you doing? And you go, fine, sir. And then they go, good, I'm glad to hear it. Keep up the good work. And you walk away, you go, okay, that was not meaningful. But if the person, and you don't have to sit down, but if the senior leader can communicate eyeball to eyeball and go, I'm listening, say something here, you know, you change the tone of the conversation. But the senior leader has to be listening. And if you, if the person goes, okay, we'll find out. Find out if Tom really wants to know. Let me tell you the problem here. And you start going through it and you just go, great, work on that. Now, what I found is one, you gotta write it down. And it helps sometimes to have someone write it down with you, but if not, you gotta write it down, get it. And then you gotta get them an answer back. And it's okay to give them an answer back that says, I can't fix your problem. I sympathize with you, I've checked into it, that's how it is. But you got back and they go, hey, listen. And if you can fix the problem, you need to. But that's the, the thing is, once you listen, once you tell them you want to listen, you get the responsibility. Because if you, if you do the, the Heisman after that, it's a real problem. Can you all imagine someone doing that to him at a cocktail party? I mean, <laughs> who the hell else is at the cocktail party? <laughs> and Michael Jackson just walked in. Um, I think we have time, if, if you don't mind, for one last question. Of course, yeah. If, if there is one. Yes, sir. In construction, uh, we have teams out in the field building projects. Sometimes they're out of the main office for two plus years. Um, you've done a great job in telling us through the video conference how the big picture gets filtered down to your individual teams. Um, one thing that I don't think the construction industry does well is get lessons learned from the field, not so much back up to the top, but to the other people dealing with the same issues. Can you talk about how that's important in the military and how you deal with that and how that communication happens? Sure. I'm trained as an engineer, so if you guys ever need any tips on construction, just give me a yell. <laughs> Don't go near any bridge I build. Don't, you know. Um, yeah, here's how we did it. The first is we were in these silos and they were used to, to communicating up. And the problem is that you communicate up and down. Sometimes you don't even know what's relevant, what questions to ask because the, the battle down here is so unique. What would you ask? Well, how's it going? But what we did in this video teleconference is, is we set up a schedule where you couldn't do it every day because it was only 90 minutes. We would rotate through our task forces, which is are down at the major and lieutenant colonel level, with a requirement for them to brief. And what they would do is it ended up being about once every three weeks for each task force as you rotate through. So every day a task force is briefing but each task force does it about every three weeks. And what they would, but all of them are on there. And when they briefed, what they did, we told them to brief something bad, either a mistake they made or something that isn't working, but we also told them to brief something that is. And the reason we did that is because, one, we, learned, we wanted to learn both, but two, you never wanna have somebody just brief something they screw up and then not be able to sort of advertise, hey, we're not all screwed up down here, or you won't get the right. So what we started having was, an element in one area, guys, we are seeing a different kind of tactic here, and it's driving us nuts. And, and the enemy was changing so fast. They went through a period when we were hitting them at night, so at night they started going outside and sleeping 200, 300 meters away from the target, which is very dangerous. They went through an era when they stopped having weapons around them. We went through an era when they were all sleeping in suicide vests. But you don't want to learn that through personal experience. You want other people to learn that. So we did that briefing thing, and so it, it, it got everybody in the command, even back in D.C. and whatnot, the State Department. They're hearing this, which is granular. They're hearing these are operators who are in the fight every night talking, and they, those best uh, practices would be passed. But I think the real, the rest of the learning occurred simultaneously because you'd get up and brief, and you'd say this, 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 I'm having this problem with here. And a whole bunch of people would start chatting with you or calling you or an email and you say, tell me more about this. Or new tactic, hey, we've seen that. Here's what we saw. 
And, and we started this connection laterally that didn't go through the headquarters at all, that was immediate, it was effective. We had people fly in places like you'd have something and says, let me send one of my guys to you today, put them on a helicopter, get them to you, and we're going to show you exactly what we've seen. It was completely new for our command and really, really effective. And as we hooked our other partners, started had conventional units and, and CIA and everybody more hooked, the lessons went into them as well. Some lessons came back from them, but that never got as good as I wanted it to be, but, but it worked uh, really, really effectively for us. Thank you. Well, General, thank you so much uh, for your leadership and your service, and most of all, for sharing time with us today. Well, I've had a great time. Thank great. you so much. Thank you. Crystal will be here for a while. Um, if you got a book or if you just want to ask him another question or, or do a meet and greet, he'll be here for a little while afterwards and you're welcome to have your book signed.